God bless the great state of Oklahoma. Thank you so much for sending a strong, principled, conservative warrior like Congressman Jim Bridenstine to Congress. Let me tell you this, this man has a backbone of steel. And he is standing and fighting for the state of Oklahoma and the Constitution and our values every day in the United States Congress. So last Thursday in Cleveland, we had kind of a quiet evening. What an amazing array of talent on that stage. Yes. How fantastic is it to see so many young dynamic, inspirational leaders stepping forward to lead the Republican Party and to lead the United States of America. And what a contrast with the Democrats. I, you know, I think the first Democratic debate is going to consist of Hillary Clinton and the Chipotle clerk. <laughs> Now, 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 actually, that's not fair. We can't forget about Bernie Sanders. So now, the Democratic field consists of a wild-eyed socialist with ideas that are dangerous for America and the world and Bernie Sanders. <laughs> you know, it's pretty amazing. It, it looks like the Democrats, they may not have a debate. They keep de delaying their debate, September, October, November. I think they may just move it to 2017. After the election. Well, you know, actually, they had planned an early Democratic primary debate. The problem was the debate invitation was emailed to Hillary. You know, I am so thrilled to be with so many friends and patriots here in Oklahoma today. We're here because America is in crisis. We're here because we're bankrupting our kids and grandkids. We're here because our constitutional rights are under assault every day from Washington, D.C. And we are here because America has receded from leadership in the world. And yet I'm here with a word of hope and optimism and encouragement and exhortation. The American people are waking up. And help is on the way. So I want to ask everyone here to look forward. Look forward to January 2017. President Cruz. <laughs> If I am elected president, let me tell you about my first day in office. Amen. The first thing I intend to do in office is rescind every single illegal and unconstitutional executive action taken by this president. President Obama likes to say he's got a phone and he's got a pen. Well, you live by the pen, you die by the pen. And my pen has got an eraser. But sadly, the corruption has not just been limited to the White House. It is spread throughout the entire federal government. And the United States Department of Justice has become the most lawless partisan Department of Justice in the history of our country. The second thing I intend to do on the very first day in office is instruct
The second thing I intend to do is instruct the United States Department of Justice to open an investigation into Planned Parenthood. And to prosecute any and all criminal violations by that organization. The administration of justice is supposed to be impartial and blind to party or ideology. The only allegiance of the Department of Justice should be to the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America. And we are going to restore integrity to the United States Department of Justice. The third thing I intend to do on the first day in office is instruct the Department of Justice and the IRS and every other agency of the federal government that the persecution of religious liberty ends today. That means that our servicemen and women will be able to worship God Almighty free of interference and their supervising officer has nothing to say about it. That means that the Little Sisters of the Poor, a Catholic charity of nuns serving the poor and elderly that the Obama administration is litigating against, in January 2017, they will receive notification that the case against them has been dismissed. The fourth thing I intend to do on the first day in office is rip to shreds this catastrophic Iranian nuclear deal. The single greatest national security threat facing America today is the threat of a nuclear Iran. You know, a few weeks ago, I observed that if this deal goes through, the Obama administration will become the world's leading financier of radical Islamic terrorism. Now, in response, President Obama took time from his busy travels abroad between the 8th and ninth hole <laughs> to attack me directly. And he said, that's ridiculous. You can't use rhetoric like that. You can't say that. That's going too far. It's true. It's true. Right. Now, sadly, Obama wasn't alone. Republicans joined with him. Mitt Romney sent out a tweet to the world that's going too far. It's over the line. Don't use that rhetoric. And likewise, Jeb Bush said the very same thing. You cannot use language like that. Back off. Take it easy. Don't say that. Do that. Let me give you all a very, very simple principle. Truth is not rhetoric. Right. You know, the, in the entire course of attacking me, President Obama didn't actually dispute any of the substance of what I said. So let's review the facts. Fact number one, Iran is today the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. Fact number two, if this deal goes through, over $100 billion will flow directly into Iran. Fact number three, if that happens, billions of those dollars will go directly to Hamas, to Hezbollah, to the Houthis, to radical Islamic terrorists across the globe. And jihadists will use those billions to murder Americans, to murder Israelis, to murder Europeans. Amen. Christians. If President Obama doesn't like the rhetoric 
of his administration becoming the leading financier of radical Islamic terrorism. There's an easy solution. Stop financing radical Islamic terrorism. The fifth thing I intend to do on the first day in office is begin the process of moving the American embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, the once and eternal capital of Israel. Now, you know, a lot of presidential candidates, both Democrat and Republican, have promised to do exactly that. But what happens when they get elected? They don't do it. They get to the White House and their team comes up to them and says, you know, if we do that, there'll be some other folks in the Middle East who'll be unhappy with us. If you haven't noticed, they're already pretty unhappy with us. Let me tell you what I think is the biggest difference between me and the other fine gentlemen that were standing on that stage in Cleveland. With me, you know exactly what you're going to get. That's right. Amen. Amen. With me, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do exactly what I said I would do. That's day one. <laughs> day two, IRS. Oh, okay. There are 365 days in a year, four years in a presidential term, and four years in a second term. <laughs> By the end of it, there are going to be a whole lot of newspaper editors and reporters and journalists who check themselves into therapy. <laughs> In the days that follow, I will go to Congress and we will repeal every word of Obamacare. In the days that follow, I will instruct the Federal Department of Education, which should be abolished, that Common Core ends today. In the days that follow, we will rebuild our military and honor our commitments to our soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines. And we will allow our servicemen and women to exercise their right to keep and bear arms. In the days that follow, we will finally, finally, finally secure the borders and end sanctuary cities. Abolish the IRS. And in the days that follow, I will go to Congress. We will pass fundamental tax reform, adopting a simple flat tax. Where every American can fill out his or her taxes on a postcard. And when we do that, we should abolish the IRS. There are 90,000 employees at the IRS. We need to padlock that building. Take all 90,000 and put them down on our southern border. Now, I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but if you think about it, it would work. imagine you spent, traveled thousands of miles in the blazing sun, you're swimming the Rio Grande. The first thing you see is 90,000 IRS agents. You turn around and go home, too. Now, some of y'all may be thinking all of that makes sense. It's basic common sense. Live within your means. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. Don't bankrupt your kids and grandkids. Yes. That's right. Follow the Constitution. Yes. Follow the Bible. <laughs> but you may be wondering, is it possible? Yes. Can we do it? Yes. You know, Scripture tells us there's nothing new under the sun. I think where we are now is very, very much like the late 1970s. Yes. The parallels are uncanny. Same failed domestic policy. Same misery, stagnation, and malaise. Same feckless and naive foreign policy. In fact, the exact same countries, Russia and Iran, openly laughing at and mocking the President of the United States. Why is it that that analogy gives me so much hope, gives me, gives me so much optimism? Because we know how the story ends. Millions of Americans rose up from the grassroots and became the Reagan Revolution. Yeah. Let me tell you, the same thing is happening again. Yes, it is. Amen. All across Oklahoma, all across this country. Oklahoma is going to play a critical role in the Republican presidential primary. That's right. That's right. The calendar has been moved up. It'll start in Iowa, then New Hampshire, then South Carolina, like it always does. And those three states are hugely important. We are all in. We've got amazing teams on the ground in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. But then 10 days later, boom. It's Super Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. States all across the South get to vote. Yeah. Right after the debate, we started this bus tour. We went to, from, started in South Carolina. We went to Georgia. We went to Alabama. We went to Tennessee. We went to Mississippi. We went back to Tennessee. We went to Arkansas. And we're ending it here in the great state of Oklahoma. Yeah. Those southern states, including my home state, the great state of Texas, we're all voting on March 1st. And I got to tell you, Texas and Oklahoma, we agree on just about everything. Well, except football. And let me tell you the role of Oklahoma and the other southern states on Super Tuesday. Our role together is to ensure that the next Republican nominee for president is a real and genuine conservative. That's how we win if we nominate another campaign conservative. If we nominate Democrat light, we lose. And we can't lose. So I'm here today asking each of you for three things. Number one, I ask each of you to join us. We have an incredible leadership team here in the state of Oklahoma, respected conservative leaders across this state that have stood up and come together. I ask every one of you to volunteer for our campaign, to volunteer in your county, to volunteer in your precinct, to reach out to your friends and neighbors and loved ones, and to unite conservatives. The second thing I ask is for every one of you to go online to tedcruz.org. 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 And to contribute. Some of you may be able to max out. If you can, God love you. I promise you we will use the resources to communicate our conservative message across this country. But everyone here can contribute something. Everyone here can give $10 or $25 or $50. And let me tell you the biggest reason to do so. Because when you do so, you got skin in the game. You're invested. Then it's not my campaign. It's our campaign. Amen.
When you do so, that's when you're going to speak up and you're going to call your mom. You're going to call your son, your next door neighbor, your business partner, your college roommate. And you're going to say, this race matters. Stand with me. The third thing I would ask of each of you is to pray. Yes. Yes. Amen. Lift me up in your prayers. Lift our family up in your prayers and pray for our nation. That America, that we wake up and we stand up for the Constitution and freedom together. The Reagan revolution that happened in 1980, the same thing is happening today. Look around. Look at the men and women who are here. Look at the fact that we're standing in the rain and nobody's left. Let me ask something. Everyone who is under 30, please raise your hand. Take a look around. Take a look around. That is the future of Oklahoma. It's the future of this country. I'm going to close with this. For all of us, freedom isn't some abstract concept we read about in a school book. It's personal and real. For me, I think about my dad, Rafael Cruz. He was born in Cuba. <laughs> que bueno. <laughs> ah, que bueno, otra vez. <laughs> he fought in the Cuban Revolution. He was imprisoned and tortured. Batista's army beat my father halfway to death. My dad fled Cuba in 1957. He came to America with nothing. A hundred dollars in his underwear. He couldn't speak English. He got a job washing dishes. Made 50 cents an hour. Worked full-time, paid his way through school, went on to, on to start a small business in the oil and gas industry. Today, my father is a pastor. He travels the country preaching the gospel. When I was a kid, my dad used to say to me over and over again, when we faced oppression in Cuba... I had a place to flee to. If we lose our freedom here, where do we go? That is why all of us are here. Because we will not go quietly into the night. We will not give up on our children. We are, will not give up on our grandchildren. We will not give up on freedom or the Constitution. And we will not give up on the United States of America. Thank you and God bless you.